My most vivid memories of the port are the ones from when I was younger, back when I had more interactions with the world and less cares. I've been living in the port for a pretty good chunk of my life, but my experience living here is kind of limited because I'm usually at home, chilling. I honestly never even really thought too much about living here until very recently because I'll be moving away pretty shortly. I would say that here has made me a great person because before I was kind of like shy um, and quiet, but now I like to be an advocate for other people. I like to be a leader. There's art to see in every corner from dozens of talented people, and it also has its fair share of weirdos and other kooky characters, specifically in Central Square. It's the kind of chaotic energy I'm probably gonna miss more than anything else. The places I've been to more out of necessity than anything else have been the places where I've made the most memorable memories, whether it be good or bad. I really owe this place for making me the man I am today. Without the support of the people around me and the opportunities presented to me that can only be found here, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I am today. A lot of the kids were going outside and having fun and playing at the park. Everybody would just play with each other. Cause all the kids would play kickball, we would swing like on the swings, monkey bars, everything. Welcome to the 24th annual Do It Your Damn Self National Youth Film Festival. I'm Chris Hastings, executive producer for World Channel at WGBH in Boston. We're glad you can join us for this all virtual experience as we come together to celebrate and amplify youth voices in film. Founded in 1996, Do It Your Damn Self is now the longest running youth film festival in the country. It all started in a gritty Cambridge neighborhood known as The Port. This revolutionary festival focused on youth perspectives, tackling complex issues of identity, social justice, and activism. The selected works broach personal experiences and use experimental approaches of these topics. When six Cambridge teens recognized they were being misrepresented in the media, they boldly declared that to make change happen, sometimes you have to do it your damn self. Today, that legacy continues with nine films selected to screen. Touching on topics from race to immigration, this year's festival illuminates young changemakers who strive to disrupt and move the conversation. We'll begin by rolling right into our films, and following each segment, we'll do a brief interview with the filmmakers. After the show, we hope you'll join us for a live QA with all the directors. If you'd like to donate or participate in a live conversation, just click the link below. And with that, let's get started with our first film this evening. Shoe Polish by Dennis Dolan. So, boy, here we go. In case you somehow aren't aware, blackface is the process by which a non-black person does their makeup to make themselves appear like a black person, often to perform as a caricature of a blind person in theater or film productions. This form of performance is widely considered to be offensive by most people, including myself, as it tends to be used to paint an insulting picture of black people. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the entire history of blackface, because then we'd be here all day. I'm also only going over the times where a white man impersonates a black man because Christ we'd be here all week. So, I decided to go through some notable examples of blackface in film, and for reasons I'll go into later, I will restrict myself to only doing American films. Well, let's get into our first one. Oh god, oh god, do I have to start with this one? Seriously? 
Birth of a Nation is a propaganda film that came out in 1915 and is based off of the book The Klansman written by Thomas Dixon Jr. that is about the birth of the KKK, a conservative group infamous for targeting, abusing, and frequently killing black people because they believed that they were the inferior race. Now, this film carries a frankly aggressive amount of baggage and is arguably the best case for how a film can inspire people in all of the wrong ways. Whilst this film is still shown in film school for various reasons that I will not be getting into, I feel as though it is important to note that this film is an ungodly amount of racist. There are so many people in blackface that I just decided to randomly skip to random points in the film and found an example of it on my first try. Another big thing to note about this film is that it is arguably the best and most famous example for New South Revisionism, which is a process by which historians make it seem like the Confederacy was the real victims of the Civil War. If you're looking for a modern day example, just look at the massive amount of people who still say that the Civil War is about state rights and not about slavery. You're welcome. And as if that wasn't enough, it is so racist that it was responsible for the rebirth of the Klan that still lives in the US over 100 years later. God, we have to move on. The Jazz Singer is a film that came out in 1927 is about a Jewish man defying his father's beliefs to become a jazz singer. Now, as much as many of us probably don't want to accept, this film does actually have a very important place in film history, as it was the first feature film to have recorded dialogue. Whilst films had recorded sound before this point, this time people were watching a movie in the theater and actually hearing people talk for the first time. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you, you ain't heard nothing. You wanna hear Tootsie Tootsie? All right, hold on, hold on. Now, whilst this is an important milestone in cinematic history, it is quite a shame that it does predominantly feature the film star, Al Jolson, in blackface. One of the most notable being the now infamous scene of him performing the song Mammy in front of an adoring crowd. Now, that scene is objectively pretty hard to watch nowadays, as not only is there a man in blackface, but he also is singing a song titled Mammy, which is another offensive caricature of black people. Now that is undoubtedly offensive now, but if you look into the man behind the makeup, you see something interesting. Whilst there is plenty to suggest that Al Johnson was an asshole, he greatly supported the integration of black culture into mainstream media. For example, he attempted to have an all-black dance group perform with him at a time when black people were banned from Broadway shows, and he greatly supported the work of playwright Garland Anderson, which would eventually lead to the first all-black theater production. Does that justify the performance in The Jazz Singer? Probably not. Even though he did do a lot of good for black people at the time, I think it's gotten overshadowed by his offensive portrayal these days. Now we're getting into an interesting area of blackface in film. Soul Man is a film that came out in 1986 and is about a privileged white kid who, after being cut from his family when trying to fund his college tuition, attempts to acquire a diversity scholarship to Harvard by pretending to be a black man. Oh, oh boy, here we go. So, through roughly the 70s and 80s, blackface mostly seemed to stop being a thing in mainstream media, apart from being in satirical works. It would be used to reference the many stereotypes and struggles that black people face on a daily basis. For example, films like Silver Streak and Watermelon Man all attempted to show the struggles black people faced in America to varying degrees of success. Some worked a little bit, but ended up being offensive for a lot of people, and some, like this film, tried but ultimately fell flat on their face and managed to do no such good. This film falls flat on its face so hard that it's garnered a reputation over the years as being one of the more offensive films with blackface in it. Ah, that's impressive. One thing of note, this film is arguably solely responsible for killing the career of the film's star C. Thomas Howell, an actor who was in nothing but hits like E.T. and The Outsiders. And it's mostly because the film doesn't really understand how to make fun of stereotypes. For example, this film may examine and try to delegitimize many black stereotypes of the 80s, such as Prince, aggressive sexual predators, and whatever the blue hell this is. However, it comes off more as the greatest hits of said racist stereotypes. The film never really condemns these stereotypes, but just references them. Ultimately, it's a film that tried to be something profound, but turned into the very thing it was parodying. Oh my god, we actually came across a watchable movie. I, I'm, I'm genuinely surprised. Uh, shame it's the last one. Anyway, anyways. Tropic Thunder is a film that came out in 2008 and is about a group of actors who are portraying soldiers in an up-and-coming war film who are forced to become soldiers in real life when an insurgent group threatens their lives. 
Now, Tropic Thunder is pretty widely regarded as one of the better parody films to have come out in recent years, and much like any parody, it comes with its controversies. Not only does it have a character portraying blackface, but it also seemingly takes spot shots at mental illness from an outsider's perspective. You m -m 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 However, the movie doesn't do that and instead of fire shots at the people who take pot shots at it. For example, Robert Downey Jr. does not portray a black man, but plays an Australian method actor who decides to get pigmentation surgery to become a black man for a film. Instead of laughing at the people who are black and mentally handicapped, they laughed at the people who laughed at the people who are black and mentally handicapped. I don't believe you people. Huh. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean, you people? Huh? I However, does that make the overall practice okay? I would argue no. A single well-written character performed greatly by an actor in a well-liked movie isn't going to change the decades of offensive portrayals. Just because Taika Waititi made a really good and really funny Nazi satire in Jojo Rabbit doesn't mean that the entire Nazi regime didn't kill 6 million Jewish people during the Holocaust. And it's clear that many people still hold that statement true to this day about blackface. At the beginning of this, I stated that I wasn't going to sample foreign films. There were two reasons why, because A, Christ almighty, we would have been here for a month. And B, we as Americans are more than familiar with the struggles black people face every day. The history of the US is littered with the mistreatment of people whose skin color is different than those who have the power. And that rings especially true for black people. How much like the birds and the bees talk, parents of black kids have to give a talk to their kids about the dangers of the police. How redlining, a now illegal and widely considered unethical process, has still made it nearly impossible for black families to take out a loan. How white men with a lot of power have created systems designed to keep people of color as second-class citizens and treat it as less than human for nearly 400 years. And blackface is merely another pawn in that whole scheme. How this process has managed to survive this long is beyond. And in some cases, the act of doing blackface sometimes isn't even the most offensive part of the film. The Birth of a Nation was a three hour long racism parade that gave the client a second chance at life. The jazz singer, whilst innovative for the time, used a performance art that many people consider offensive. Soul Man tried to make a statement about black stereotypes, but just became one by the time the credits rolled. And Tropic Thunder, even though not making fun of black people, still can't erase the long and rough history that it has. Hell, I didn't even go into the other racist stereotypes in film history. I could have just as easily gone through a list of the times a white man has played Fu Manchu, or how many times Rob Schneider has played an Indian man, or how the entirety of the film industry has treated Native Americans. And these practices have been going since Hollywood started. In fact, the money that Birth of a Nation gained was so much that it led to the creation of Hollywood. To put it into perspective, if you count for inflation, The Birth of a Nation was roughly as successful financially as Gone with the Wind, Star Wars, and Titanic, if not more. And if I'm being honest, it all just feels so ironic. Hollywood these days tries to be liberal and inclusive and tries to improve its image. Yet it's important to understand that that very institution was built in no small part to the many, many people who decided to brush shoe polish on their face. Michael Monestein, Executive Director of the Central Square Business Improvement District. I'm fortunate enough that I get to show up every day, come to Central Square, I live in Cambridge, um, come here and get to do this work. There's all these special things that make Central Square the place to be. And in my opinion, it's the beating heart of the city of Cambridge. Good, how are you? All right, thank you. We're gonna give you a quick tour of Starlight Square. Follow me. 
So the original idea for Starlight came from um, an architect by the name of Mark Boys Watson, his son Matthew Boys Watson, and Nina Berg. So the three of them have long thought about this parking lot being more than just a place for cars. How can it be a place for people? And Starlight is going to change the way we feel about surface parking lots. Surface parking lots that people just leave their cars for hours at a time. There's no activity, there's no community, there's no conversation. And now we have a place where those things are at the center of it all. So this is like the grand entrance. When you arrive at Starlight, you're gonna see the Central Square marquee. You're gonna have two doors you can walk into. Um, the amphitheater seats 150 people physically distanced from each other. And along this entry wall, you'll see some great messaging. Starlight is a place of worship, place for learning, dining, and dialogue. And I hope you come join us. Hi, my name is Cassie Chapados. My pronouns are the She Series, and I'm the production manager at Central Square Theater. So I think that Cambridge, and Central Square in particular, tends to be a really community-oriented neighborhood, um, at least in my experience. And one of the things that's important to us at Central Square Theater is that community engagement, is creating programming, not just on our main stage, but with our educational groups, with all the stuff that we do to engage the community. A space like this like, really lets us do that because it, there's not the same kind of barrier to entry that normal sort of theater spaces tend to have in terms of like they might be really expensive or they're hard to get to or whatever. Like this is a very inexpensive space for patrons. It's free in many cases, right? And it's easy to get to. That for us is like really hammers home all these community oriented ideas. Now I need you to use your imagination a little here because this is one area that we still need to, to finesse a little. But at the backdrop of the potluck mural painted by David Victor, this beautiful piece is gonna be the community center area. So right behind you, once all these materials leave, we're gonna have space that the Margaret Fuller House will be able to show up to with their kids. Uh, the community art center is gonna be doing a beautiful mural along this wall over here. And the uh, Cambridge Community Center and Tutoring Plus will show up in different ways as well. So this used to be a parking lot for cars that we've turned into a place for people. And not just any people, residents of Cambridge, a whole bunch of good folks who abut Central Square. Well, I mean, I think right now they're more important than ever because we can't perform inside. And what we've been doing is a lot of theater companies have doing things online with Zoom or sort of other like Facebook Live, that kind of stuff. But the beauty of live theater is that it's, it occurs in a space in community with not just the performers, but the audience as well. It's really hard to do what we do in, in the way that's meant to be done. There's a thing that already exists that's recorded performance that you watch alone in your house. And that's film and television, and they do that well already. So for us, outdoor performance right now is essential because it's the only thing that we can do. Um, but Starlight is beautiful and has a lot of public art. So we'll talk more about this as we enter into the community space, but these two pieces curated by Street Theory, uh, the same team who did the Queendom above H Mart. Um, a lot of beautiful public art that's being added to this. Yeah, look, I think public art helps benefit the community because it gives you something to react to. It helps start a conversation. It's a meeting point for friends. It lets you know that the lights are on and that there's people inside really working to make a, dis a difference. As a former performer and as a theater maker now, I, I, I think there's something really joyful in getting to perform outside and the challenges and uniqueness of that. So I think it's fun as a performer to, to get to live in that world. So I think mostly 
it's it's a lot of excitement. And for us as an organization to to remind the people of Cambridge and our patrons outside of Cambridge that like we're still here. We know the times are weird, but we've found this space, we've created it in conjunction with all these other really wonderful people, and we can now do what we do, you know? Not only is COVID happening in the background of all of this and the reason why we've turned our whole community outside, in addition to that, there's this incredible civil rights moment going on right now. And the wall on Bishop Allen is, is great. And all these photos collage together, celebrate images from um, uh, rallies across the United States. So what you see here is a bunch of photos from Boston, Los Angeles, New York City, Minneapolis, protest photos. Um, while we might be miles apart, we have so much in common. And at this time, right now, it's important that we band together as a community and celebrate that. And Starlight is a celebration. As much as it is saving our arts organizations, giving them a chance to come outside, it's a celebration of this moment we're in that's part of this larger movement. So this last piece happens to be one of my favorite pieces um, erected onto the surface of Starlight. It celebrates both Bob and Janet Moses, civil rights leaders in our community who are fundamental to the civil rights mo movement of the 60s and have been active participants ever since. And um, standing here right to our far left is uh, YPP's office, uh, the Young People's Algebra Project, started by Bob Moses. So one thing we need to do is celebrate uh, these individuals while they're here. The passing of John Lewis, uh, we are all now celebrating his life's work um, with the end of the chapter of his life. It, it gives me joy that we get to celebrate both Bob and Janet now uh, as they're with us and sort of appreciate and smell the roses while we have them. I mean, I, I'm always compelled by something that you know, three months ago it didn't exist and now here we are sitting in it. You know, I think that that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing people smile behind their face masks. I'm looking forward to um, that, that wow moment when they first pull up and it all becomes real. So we're, we're gonna find ways to lift up this entire community and, and bring your mom, bring your, bring your kids, bring the whole family, fun for all. It's unprecedented and you know, hopefully we'll be able to do it forever. Like this could become a thing we do every year, which would be awesome. Yeah. And then now we'll know how to do it. We don't have to do all the same stuff again. <laughs> when you have a special place, you have to put in that work to make sure that it remains special. And Central is that central special place that we should all be putting time and energy into to make sure that we keep it special.
Every time I encounter a teenager, I do make assumptions. I assume they're geniuses, I assume they're gonna change the world, and I assume they're freedom fighters. My name is Cesar Cruz, and I'm one of the founders for Homies Empowerment. I had already been a, a teacher for over a decade, and I kept seeing even the best schools push certain kids out with certain rules that they call policies. We started off working with young people after school who were gang involved. And about five years into our program, the young people say, man, I love going to the sweat lodge. I love our after school classes. I love when we go on our hikes. I love our homies dinners. Imagine if this was our high school. And I wanted to build a school with those kids to say like, well, let's build the school that you do want to be a part of where you don't want to run away from, but you want to run to. The system has taught young people histories that they cannot connect with. They get bored. There's a lot that gets missed when that happens. Whenever Homeless Empowerment would take students out to field trips, it makes them feel more excited to learn about the history of the world, the history of their people, of their culture, their experiences. In ninth grade, you will be speaking up. You will be conducting seminars. You will be hosting and meeting with architects. You will be building the future as soon as you arrive at Echos because we believe that much in your voice. We wanna make every single class project-based. And what we mean by that is meaningful projects that they care about. Once lunch happens, I want to be able to provide the space that's necessary for our young people in Oakland who are feeling really disconnected, our families who are screaming for help, for a space where their child can feel like they have a second home. Our school will prepare them for the world to become intellectual learners. When young people find their voice, when they find out that they have a destiny, they have a purpose in life, it's gonna help them weather every storm. And for me personally, I found my voice. And now you cannot silence it. You cannot stop it. And that's the same with young people. We are speaking to the principals of middle schools to say, who are the kids that you know they're already done with middle school? And when no other school is welcoming them, we want to speak to those young people and say, you know, if you hate school, maybe it's for good reason. We want to be the anti-school school. And would you give us a shot? What prompted you to make a film um, about blackface? There's a couple of things. Uh, if I were to simplify it, uh, for whatever reason, it was on my mind. I can't remember the reason why it was on my mind. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I was it was I was scrolling through Amazon Prime and I noticed that uh, on Amazon Prime for free to view was the film Watermelon Man, which is a film about a bigot who has to confront his bigotry when he wakes up suddenly as a black man. That movie has blackface in it. And that sort of sparked this question in me, how much has this actually happened? And so I just sort of went on Wikipedia and just sort of like looked up how much this has actually happened. And it kind of floored me how, just how many people have done it. Like I looked it up, Judy Garland did it, Gene Kelly did it, both Laurel and Hardy did it. I was like, wow. Yeah, it, it just, it kind of floored me. And I was like, maybe this is something that it's worth talking about at least a little bit, you know? How did they start planning Starlight Square? I'm sorry, did they start planning Starlight Square before COVID or because of COVID? They started planning it before COVID. I know it was an idea that they had had before and they were trying to figure out how to bring it to life. But then, um, when, and the Central Square Bid is a relatively new organization. So I know they had started planning it, I think fall of 2019, and it was their idea to kind of bring some like life and outdoor performance to Central Square. And, um, but from what I had talked to Michael about, and I think a lot of this was probably off camera, but um, he said that once COVID hit, they saw it as an opportunity to really adapt their idea to a, um, to, be more meaningful to the community i think and i think it got a lot more popular because it was 
like one of the only places people could actually go to like have ex have more some like experiences that were similar to before COVID. How did you learn about HOs? Um, uh, I've been working with this nonprofit organization for a while, and then um, I actually got to do a paid internship with them, um, where we make a video for a client, and then the client we had was Homies Apartment. Um, the school is in development right now. And um, we just did the video to promote it. Normal schools don't really fulfill every student and how Hechos is um, making that, uh, helping students who don't fit in normal school. What do you check when asked to provide your race? How does this make you feel? So what are you planning to do for Ms. Peterson's identity project? I'm just gonna ask my mom some questions about Maryland and my dad some questions about Nigeria. Probably make a PowerPoint or something. What about you? Yeah, I don't really know yet. I mean, my dad's side's easy, but my mom's, I don't really know them that well. I mean, I don't see them much. Just ask your mom some questions about Brazil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. I just. I don't know how I'm going to explain my mom's entire culture in a PowerPoint. I don't even speak the language. Like, how do I even connect that to me? How am I supposed to explain my identity when I can barely explain the other half of it? Mariana, it's ready. There are different options depending on like which form because there's usually different things. So like sometimes you can check multiple boxes, mm -hmm. which I prefer because, you know, it actually gives information on what racial information I am. And in that case, I would check white and black. And then there's also sometimes where there's the option for multiracial, which is a pretty good. I mean, it still makes me feel seen. And the worst one is when it's just other, mm. which isn't my favorite because they're just basically saying, oh, you're too complicated. Let's just put you over there, you know? And it just doesn't make sense because, you know, it offers no information. Like, I could be an alien and just check off the answer <laughs> and it'd be fine. So, not my favorite. How does being mixed slash biracial affect your sense of identity? Mariana! What? Mariana, where are you going for supper? Oh, okay. I gotta go. I'll call you later. What's the drama? What? What do you mean drama? You were talking to someone. Oh, yeah. I was talking to Sierra. We have this identity project for school, and I have to put some stuff about my heritage, but I'm not really sure what I should put. It's weird, because, like, even though I identify as, like, Haitian and white, I feel like being mixed is, like, a whole other thing, like, I'm Haitian, I'm white, and I'm also mixed. Like, mm. I'm not just Haitian, I'm not just white. It's like mixed, which is like a whole different thing, which does kind of affect my identity a little bit. So it's kind of harder to identify with like just white people or just Haitian people, something like that. What are some of the issues you face when it comes to race? Mariana, just put that you're half American, half Brazilian. Yeah, but like technically aren't I all American? Like I'm Brazilian too, you know, but I never lived there. It's kind of like how I'm half black, half white, but I can't relate to a lot of the black culture in America because one, black culture in Brazil is much different than black culture in America, and two, I don't really see that side of my family much. Luckily enough, I haven't experienced any like outward issues with people directly, but I think at least what's hard for me is that I don't look like my parents a lot, or ever actually, I should say. <laughs> and like sometimes people who don't know my family they won't know that like we are together as a family so we'll always get weird looks sometimes if we're like together i think that's a little bit hard have you seen like any issues affect your family or friends or something like that my brother even though we are white i mean we still appear as people of color and we will be treated like that so mm -hmm. i know my brother's been called the n-word before mm -hmm. and i remember i was in with him at his school and a girl called him the whitest black person he, she's ever met. 
I'm not saying like, oh, I'm mixed. I'm protected from all of that stuff. But mm-hmm. like, it's definitely been something that's been there. Cause like, I know like for me, like, at least in stores, like I never really felt like I was followed or anything like that. Like maybe once or twice, but that was just cause maybe I was like more aware of it at the time. But I know that my mom, like she definitely feels followed a lot at stores, which was like really hard for me to like understand. Cause that was just like, wait, what? Like that doesn't happen to me. Yeah, even though it's like nothing like that has happened to me like I still have that like fear Mm -hmm. as a person of color yeah that's true I get a little nervous when the police drive by me Mm -hmm. and if I leave a store Mm -hmm. I make sure I have the receipt super obvious in my hand so then people don't think I'm stealing Mm -hmm. so like those things that people of darker skin they deal with more more often like it's still ingrained in me what are some things that you've learned or like taken away being mixed well Marianne, I would say that, why don't you just say that um, your nationality is American, of course, but your heritage is Brazilian and American. You're definitely more American than a Brazilian kid. What? What does that even mean? A uh, Brazilian kid, to be a Brazilian kid, it's to be the most happy kid in the world. Even if you're poor, you can play uh, free on the streets, um, you can play bambole. You can play jump rope, you can fly kites, which the Brazilians love to do. I guess purely from like the organizing by racial boxes section, mm-hmm. where like even though there isn't, like you do feel like you're not really fit anywhere perfect, mm-hmm. I think that can be turned in a really great way. So since you don't have this one place to go, you can go anywhere. So there is like a sense of ambiguity that comes with being mixed. And it's really great because you get to explore all these different cultures and people. Do you have any last comments or like final things you want to say? I mean, we've been talking a lot about the negative parts of being mixed, but mm-hmm. I love being mixed. Mm-hmm. I tan really well. I love it. I love my family. Mm-hmm. I love my skin. It's great. What is bambole? What? You don't know what bambole no, is? I never heard of it. Okay, I have one. I'll show it to you. It's a hula hoop.
We'll do our best to give Leo a good life. Thank you for this opportunity. Hey, loser! Hey, I'm talking to you. Shut it, Chase. This is our country. This is our land. We stole it fair and square, so go back to Mexico, wet bag. This is our country. This is our land. Go back this to Mexico. Our country. Bag. Go this back is to Mexico. Our land. Bag. Go back to Mexico. It's time for dinner, son. I'm not your son. I already have a mom. You quiero a mis hijos. Regresen a mis hijos, por favor. Todo va a estar bien, mamá. Soy yo, Leo.
arts education in the United States is often considered to be outside of the core curriculum, shoved aside to meet the prescribed math, science, and language requirements. When arts are taught in the classroom, they oftentimes do not speak to the students' experiences and tastes. Hip-hop has been slowly accepted into academic spaces like Harvard and UMass Boston for the powerful stories and captivating written work that have been created throughout its now 40-year history. Audible has collaborated with the Loop Lab on a series of pieces that explore English language fluency and literacy within the Port neighborhood of Cambridge. In this piece, we discuss the opportunities and barriers in using hip-hop as a language arts teaching tool. We spoke to hip-hop artist and composer Billy Dean Thomas and educator Kristen Knowlton about their experiences with hip-hop culture inside and outside the classroom. I'm walking down the road to where success is Blame my adolescence to the folks I disrespected But sorry, not sorry, take you on a word safari Penmanship like a panther flow blacker than Afro Barbies Thank my mama who raised me, I'm lying Commas raised me, I'm flying Past the pages of sentences and my phrases But to all the haters who you know we don't believe you And yeah, you know we gonna tell it to our people So why you going? I'ma cast a new part Better yet, I wrote the movie, wrote the script, I'm art And I be like Dr. Seuss in the booth I'm just spitting truth and it's proof And it's in the pudding, it shoulda, coulda been you It's me Would you able to introduce yourself briefly? Who are you? What do you do? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Billy Dean Thomas, and um, I'm a hip-hop artist and also composer. Um, I've been making music probably since I was 13 years old, so for a little bit of a while. My name is Kristen Knowlton. I'm a 12-year veteran teacher here at CRLS, Cambridge Ridge Latin School. Um, I am a special educator, so I've done predominantly math work, but this year I'm running a postgraduate program for students that teaches um, adulting 101 is the easiest way that I can say that. I think my first introduction to hip hop ever was Biggie Smalls. I think I was like 10 years old and um, my uh, my mom's partner at the time was listening to a Biggie song and I was just so captivated by his flow. And also like after seeing what he looked like, I think it was really shocking to me that he wasn't like conventionally like this handsome, beautiful person. I really resonated with that with Biggie Smalls because he was confident no matter what, it didn't matter what he looked like and the skills spoke for themselves. I didn't have a lot of friends that listened to it. I mean, I'm a white girl from the middle of New Hampshire. Um, not a lot of my friends listened to it. And then when I went to college, I had a lot more friends that listened to it because I came to Boston. Um, and I appreciate it and liked it, but I felt like it wasn't my space. So it felt weird, like loving it, but feeling kind of like a poser in that space. So it was hard. Um, and then I think what really got me into wanting to learn more about it and experience it in a different way is listening to kids talk about it in school and working here at CRLS and listening to kids say, you know, I'm gonna spit some rhymes later and whatever and like and drop some beats and like, okay, so this language that I shouldn't be using, but it sounds cool when they say it, so I wonder what they're talking about. I think that's really what got me into understanding more about that world and that it's something that is not a niche, it's a world. I don't remember ever being in a classroom where folks just like played rap music as a way to be a tool to learn about a poetic device like that. That's so simple and doesn't cost you anything. In the modern political sense, it's not part of Common Core. It's not what has been sort of prescripted for federal and state governments to say this is what should be ta taught. Um, that isn't to say that it's not something that it can be used to teach other things or that it could be connected to and integrated with to teach other things, but it still feels like the other instead of being a part of. It's because there's still so much of a stigma surrounding, you know, hip hop and how it's violent or just all of these things that were really sort of created in the 80s or probably even before that I'm not aware of. Um, but really, I think one, it has to be really recognized as an actual valuable, even though I think it's valuable and like my community thinks it's valuable. Um, I think the mainstream needs to value it as a credible form of literacy. 
until that common core, what everybody thinks should be taught can be shifted, a lot of places won't feel the need to shift. I feel like there are a lot of teachers here that know that a shift needs to take place, and some of them are shifting their curriculum to incorporate it, but again, there's a lot that needs to be done, and the need versus the want becomes problematic, I think. If it's done well, it's done well. I think that there are some people that want to be able to use it, but if it's superficial, you can feel that it's superficial. I just felt like it wasn't my area to be sharing. I wanted to pass the mic to somebody who could be the expert to share it, which is why I think asking students to do projects to write or to record or to speak or to perform is more powerful than me saying, I'm going to perform or let's watch somebody else perform and then talk about it because you can watch anybody you want at home. You don't need me to teach you to watch somebody. I think it's more important if somebody among us can share that and I don't have the comfort to share that. I'm not, I'm not going to spit rhymes. That's not happening. <laughs> So I worked for an organization called Hip Hop Reeducation, and basically what we did is we went inside of elementary schools, high schools, and we sort of infused hip hop into academic classes. So for example, um, my first class that I worked with, I think it was a sixth grade class, a science class, and we were supposed to be talking about the body systems, and so we had them writing rhymes to talk about digestion and things of this sort because it allowed folks to sort of retain information better um, using the repetition and using, you know, having them come up with their own rhyme schemes was really beneficial. And it actually was proven that a lot of folks' test scores increased because of this sort of method of teaching and reusing hip hop into academic classrooms. Does it challenge educational literacy? Absolutely. But I also think that it's less about hip hop and more of like, um, I guess respectability, like respectability politics. Even though there's like really dark, intense things that happen in some of the songs, it is reality. And so I think it's really important to have a balance between, you know, telling people the truth and exposing truth um, and, and also like making it like child friendly or like, what does that even mean, right? Because a lot of times we think we're protecting children, but they already know what we think we're gonna surprise them with. So there's, I think it's really just about um, providing a space to be honest and truthful and to also unpack. Like just because something is traumatic doesn't mean that you can't unpack it with your class. For me, in the work that I do, it basically means that I need to create a situation or environment or a lesson that someone else can come in to teach. And I, I would welcome that anytime, but I don't know that all teachers would do that because to teach, you have to have a certain level of, um, you command a certain level of uh, a presence in the classroom and you have to have a certain level of con control, we'll say. And not a lot of teachers are great at giving up some of that control. So they may not be good at co-creating with their students because they feel like they're not in control of that situation. And therefore, they may not be good with having another person come in and co-create with them because they're, again, not in control of that situation. I think it, that can, that's probably the biggest part of it that's problematic. Not all my students enjoy hip hop. Some of them, they don't really get it. It doesn't relate to their experience because they didn't grow up with it. Um, they're kids from other cultures and it's just not like they'll listen to it, but it's not part of who they are. So learning from it could actually be really powerful and important. So I'm going to backtrack on that and say that maybe I should. Um, but I will also say that for some of my students who are on the spectrum, literally the beats, which I enjoy and absolutely love, are overstimulating and it's a sensory thing for some of the kids. So they don't want to listen to it at any particular volume or any in any particular way. But I think we could still access the lyrics. So again... I don't know why I don't have that. I don't have a good answer for that. I haven't done it yet, and I should. I, I wouldn't communicate, I would do a performance first. Um, and yeah, so I would, generally what I like to do, especially with younger folks is like, they're not gonna listen to you unless they see that you're good at something. 
And so for me, I would start off with like a little 30 second where I'm just like spitting some crazy bars. And then they're like, oh, all right, let me chill now. And like, listen. And then um, I would probably just say, you know, um, based on like what you heard or like, um, I was really inspired and excited to like do that for you guys today because that was sort of like the reason that I was able to like, or gain interest in writing in class. And like, you know, because of, you know, uh, listening to certain rappers or whatever, like I was able to get this interest. And then it like actually helped me write my essays better. And it, like, you know, make sure you're tying in in some capacity, like how being in class right now can actually help you if you have this dream. Not everybody wants to be a rapper or a basketball player, but like, um, you know, if you do have an interest in an art form or writing scripts or whatever it is, or if you're a chef, you gotta write a menu, like, um, you know, really tying in why it's important and literacy is like very, very crucial for art. Hip-hop can be a powerful modern device for teaching critical thinking, creativity, and communication, yet it is not being leveraged today. This is an opportunity to tap into and engage the students and community members of the Bork neighborhood. Artistic activists like Billy Dean Thomas have shown that hip-hop can be used effectively in the classroom, and educators like Kristen Knowlton are starting to see the value in incorporating it into their curriculum. But before they can engage students with the art form, teachers first need to be willing to open up their classrooms to outside voices and provide freedom for their students to practice self-expression. First question is, what was your intention while making this film? Uh, I would say to like spread awareness of just kind of this experience of being mixed race and um, like how to navigate that experience or just what that is like. Um, I, I really wanted to do like a part documentary piece of it, of just like talking with my friend because I feel like with these conversations, sometimes it's hard for me to like script them. So just having that conversation and like having it be open, I feel like allowed it to have um, more issues talked about it naturally. I feel like if you're not mixed, like you wouldn't have this experience obviously. So just kind of coming out of it with like knowing something new. All right, what's something you learned about yourself or your family while filming or editing or creating this video? Hmm. Uh, I, I learned like, more about my mom's like um, childhood growing up. When I was like writing the script, I tried to, um, like when I was working with Daniel, who's like one of my teachers, he was suggesting that I had like a conversation with her about um, some like authentic, like Brazilian things that she did growing up to help me incorporate that into the script. So like the whole Bombalay thing with like hula hoop and like um, her talking about her childhood, like growing up and like, that I feel like I learned more about making this. What was the intent behind the children making eye contact with the camera or the viewer? I chose to put that in. Originally, I wasn't supposed to make the cut, but we chose to put that in so it could have like a more personal connection to, so the viewers could have like a more personal connection to the film. Why did Leo rip up the photograph while he was uh, thinking of his mom? He was frustrated. Um, Origin originally that wasn't supposed to happen either, but um, my mentors wanted to have something where he has like a breaking point kind of where he just gets frustrated all of a sudden because it's right after he gets bullied. So he kind of like hates his mom for leaving him behind in like a whole country by himself. Was this movie inspired by an actual event or was it inspired by um, something that happened to somebody you know? 
Uh, yeah, kinda. Like a few months before I wrote the film, my uncle was trying to come here with um with his wife and children, and it was like kind of hard. And because we for a month we didn't know where he was or what was happening, and we thought that you know the worst happened. So it mm -hmm. was kind of inspired by that. So the reason why I made hip hop and literacy uh, a subject of the film. It was practically because I was in a lot of those spaces and a lot of educational spaces like Harvard and like UMass Lowell and stuff like that. And they love to celebrate hip hop as like something that's like very educational, something that's very gripping and something that's very, you know, artistically like, you know, uh, thought provoking. You know what I'm saying? And for the longest, I'm just like, okay, so like we're always in these spaces. Like they're always using like the artifacts. Like we have the hip hop archives in Harvard. Like they have our they have the artifacts of hip hop. They have the action figures, the 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 vinyls, like they have freaking everything. You know what I'm saying? So I'm always like, okay, so like when exactly is it gonna be possible for like artists or just like anybody in general to just like go to a classroom and then like have like teachable moments? Because if you're gonna like have like these types of artifacts and like all these other things that like, and then just be like, oh yeah, this is like the hip hop archive. And it's like, you're gonna be giving, you know, rap artists like, you know, uh, awards in Harvard and giving rap artists like awards for like certain things and just musicians all together. I feel like at some point it does kind of beg the question, like when exactly are we going to start like, you know, using this as a tool of like education, especially if they're presenting it as that, you know what I mean? Because at that form, it's just like a matter of just empty symbolism where it's like you are acknowledging it as an educational thing, but we're not necessarily putting it into any kind of action. One word I would use to describe being a person of color in a white high school would be challenging. Defenseless. Lonely. Confusing. Neglected. One word I would probably use is isolated. Black Lives Matter protests across the world have created a wave of anti-racist fervor that took on many forms. In Poway, it took form as an Instagram account that had the goal of inciting change through sharing personal stories of discrimination in the Poway Unified School District. The Instagram account at Black and PUSD shared previous stories of incidents where students of color, specifically black students, are targeted inside and outside classrooms. A common thread that linked more than 500 incidents posted by the account was the theme of by POC students facing discrimination in predominantly white schools. Growing up in um, like schools that have a huge lack of diversity. It's been very, I wouldn't say like challenging is the right word, but it's been very like different just cause it's hard when you're like growing up and like you see, oh, no one else really looks like me. And it's kind of like different. It makes you start like to think things like, oh, why, you know, why do I look like this? My experience growing up in a school that max diversity, it's just like, you're always being watched. Like every action you take represents people who look like you and people who have similar skin color. And no matter where you are, you kind of stick out. Couple that with never having teachers that look like you or share your experiences and normally being like one or the only one or one of two students in a class. It just, it's awkward. It's always like the spotlight's on you. I grew up speaking Japanese, so when I got into school, I was put into ESL, English Second like Language, but I found that like even up until now, like the main struggle is not being able to understand because nobody's willing to slow down, and then not being understood, and so nobody's willing to take the time to understand, um, which is something that's like super consistent because like growing up it was with language nobody was willing to slow down so that I could understand them and nobody's willing to wait to like sit down and understand what I was saying um, but then later on it was more like culturally like the way people acted I never understood and then I wasn't understood and also like just with like discipline and stuff like that um, it's been very interesting for 
like staff and students and everybody to really just not take the time to understand the differences and um, take the time there. I mean, like growing up with like a lack of diversity, it's like been my whole life. You know, like ever since elementary school, like I've been like one of the few black people um, like at my school, like on my soccer team. And I guess it didn't really matter in elementary school because like kids that young, like kind of see past color. But in middle school, it was tough because like being one of like the very, very few black people, um, there wasn't a lot of support. I feel like racism is like a daily thing every day for me and for other people of color at school, especially. Um, especially at the football game, for example, the blackface. Tonight, controversy at Poway High School after a blackout themed spirit event took what some are calling a racist turn. It happened at last Friday night's football game. I feel like more people were angry, angry at the fact that it was publicized than, than the actual incident. Yeah, everybody knew it was there. There were photos taken while he was in the crowd. But when somebody goes to admin and shows them what happened, it was silent. Nobody heard anything about it. When I was 15, um, I was standing in front of Poway High and I was speaking on the phone. And she goes, well, you're just, you're speaking a different language. And I, it makes everybody uncomfortable. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, she was saying all these things like, if you want to be speaking in America, you should be speaking English. And we don't accept whatever Chinese you're speaking. And if you want to be able to speak another language, go back to your own country. And I was standing there, I was like, this is not happening right now. Um, and I look over 15 feet away from me is the vice principal who's looking at me and then just turns away immediately. And I was like, oh no. And the principal walks by, nothing. And I see kids who are like filming the interaction but not willing to step in. So I was standing here like just covered in shock and shame and embarrassment while I was trying to defend myself. And I was like fumbling over my words. And it was the first moment where I was like, uh, this is not okay. Like this is so dehumanizing and disheartening. And it was, I think the last moment where I actually took an experience of racism and stood up for myself and decided I wasn't gonna just internalize it and ignore it anymore. Like so many people had told me to do before. It's like everyone comments on it. They always like belittle me, like call me the n-word especially like there was like this one sub they like i was the only like black person in the room and they kept saying the n-word over and over and like everyone was just like uh like i couldn't really stand up for myself because nobody I really understood so i was like the only one you know so nobody really had my back there so definitely way to fix this issue um i think we just need to continue to educate um, students and peers about like these problems about like microaggressions about um, covert racism because I feel like as we do like preach this at school like these problems but like people just aren't willing to listen so I feel like if we just continually like tell them about it and tell stories about it especially from like peers that they might want to listen to that not everyone will get the message but like, a few people will get the message and then like those few people will get it and then the next time we do it more people will get it. And then eventually like, we'll just like plant like that seed in their mind and hopefully like it will sprout one day and they'll realize like what they were doing was wrong and they'll change for the better. So. Just like be nice to everyone. There's no like reason why you should hate on anyone just because of what they look like or what race they are. I think that the main issue, like I said earlier, comes from ignorance where we think that it's, we're too young to learn about it and it's too sensitive a topic. But the fact that it is so sensitive is why I think it's so important to talk about it, you know, because, you know, kids will start to make racial preferences as early as five and six years old. And I think that's really the lack of exposure to diversity, especially in living in such a homogeneously white community is where it stems from because you know these kids don't understand differences and they don't understand why kids do something kids do something a little bit differently because they look differently or they're from a different place and so i think that's they immediately ridicule something that they don't understand it's fixed with you know unlearning those unconscious biases that we created at such a young age and then relearning in a way that um, empathizes with other people and looks to understand other people
A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts. So he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusions. By thoughts I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else, it's useful in moderation. A good servant, but a bad master. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs, words, numbers, symbols and ideas with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, such as bank balances and contracts, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. It isn't spiritual. That's also an idea, a symbol. Reality is this. Realize that anybody whom you consider in matters spiritual, psychological, and so on, has an authority. Has this authority because of your opinion that he has, or she has? How do you know? It's an expression of you as you are. And don't fool yourselves. I'm not trying to put you down by talking about the quaking mess. The quaking mess may be in fact something very, very natural. The way we are, the state of affairs, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I told you all the tragic. <laughs> I believe I was in high school. I was walking home from football practice after school with a couple of my friends. 
all of a sudden a police officer pulled over hopped out of his car and told us not to move and i guess i was walking too fast for the police officers and they tried to look in my bags at first i kind of denied them because i know my rights eventually i just gave in and i let them look in my bags and they realized it was just closed And the man was following me around the store like I was gonna steal something, even though I had the money on me. And he said the thing that they always say that um, something happened a couple of blocks ago, and you fit the description of the person that was seen fleeing the seat, fleeing the scene of the crime. So I guess when the call came in, my like dad had fit the description, but like. He was not the person who did it, so they actually like beat him real bad, like real bad. He had to get stitches in his head. I was 13 years old at the time, so I was like really young. And I was coming back from my grandmother's house, and she gave me like $20. So I put the, the $20 in my socks, right? Where I live at is the South Bronx, Patterson Projects, so it's always cops around here. Anyway, the cops stopped me, right? So I was like nervous, I was like shaking a little bit, because most of the time the cops interact with somebody I know, like a friend of mine, or like my brother, or like an older head around the block, and comes to like interrogation. And it was like, why do you have a hoodie on? I'm like, I'm like, it's cold outside, I have a hoodie on. They was like, yeah, I see you walking around the block, like, what are you doing? Do you have a hoodie on, looking back at me? And the reason I was looking back is because, like, y'all following me. They was patting me down. They checked my socks, and uh, they found $20. And it was like, what is this? The only thing that was on my mind was, like, I hope I don't get shot, or I hope I don't get the $20 taken away from me because I'm hungry. Yeah, I felt kind of tough that day, you know, because I got stopped by the cops like everybody else. My brother and I, we were arrested and the police beat us pretty bad, pretty badly when we were children. I was, I was 15 at the time. The police officers, while they were filling out their forms, for no reason at all, they just stopped and said, you feel like a beat down. And the two officers were, that were involved, they took us downstairs in the 103rd precinct, the same precinct that Sean Bell was killed in. And they just kicked us in our groin repeatedly. And a black officer, came in the room and told them that's enough. He did nothing else. All he said was that's enough. I started doing research of like, why you can't wear hoodies and why like police stop black men. And I was just looking at mad posts about like police brutality. I seen Rodney King, I seen, yeah, Trayvon Martin. It comes to a point like doing all this research, I kind of got like scared of the world. The world seemed like a dark place. So I feel like every time we always get close to like get out, out of this racism, we always get like stuck into another version of it, another version of slavery. The history of America is deeply intertwined with the violence of racial oppression, where the first form of policing was slave patrols to chase down and apprehend or return runaway slaves to their owners, terrorize slaves enough to instill fear in them so that they will become discouraged from revolting against their owners, and to discipline slave workers who violate plantation rules. These patrols usually consisted of three to six men on horseback equipped with guns, rope, and whips. This organized group of Caucasian men enforced the pass system, which required slaves absent from their master's property to have a pass or ticket after the abolition of slavery with black codes, designed to limit the freedom of African Americans and target them for unjust arrests. Arrested convicts were then forced to work at private corporations. We need policemen like us, like from our community. How would it be like a suburban white male coming to New York City? and definitely to the Bronx. You're gonna obviously think some like every black person is a monster. 
because that's what you hear. You never experienced it. So that's what you hear from like TV. That's what you hear from like your family. So what you could think automatically is like, oh, black people are bad. Let's like arrest them quick. Let's like take them, like take those monsters out of the community. In 1981, the U.S. Justice Department filed a lawsuit contending that the NYPD was discriminating against blacks, Hispanics, and women in its hiring and promotion of officers. As a result, federal judge Robert Carter assured the public that there would be more female, black, and Hispanic officers on the NYC police force. A young man named Randolph Evans was shot by a, a housing police officer for no reason at all and a group of leaders in the African-American community told us that we were making no headway in dealing with police abuse in our city and they wanted us all to go into a law enforcement agency and fight from within. It was traumatizing at first because you don't want to go into the belly of your abuser, but I found that it was therapeutic by going into the police department. It helped me uh, take that demasculation that I felt when I was beaten that way, and it empowered me to fight in the police department, get promoted in that police department, and then be able to command those officers in that same police department. In 1988, 90% of the officers who ranked above captain were white. Today, it remains 79%, while 68% of NYC's population is not white. White cops also make up 45% of the police department, but get 80% of the executive promotions. We had a deputy commissioner, uh, Chief T uh, Commissioner Tucker, who was a lawyer, who was very qualified. Uh, he served under two police commissioners, but when it was time to promote someone to be the commissioner, they went and picked a white person instead of him. So it's clear that we could run fast, we could jump high, we could throw the ball far, but you know what, we can't coach the team. As we diversify on this job, we have an increased level of bullying. I've had people who speak freely making slurs. We went on a job and it was in a senior building, and it was an old lady and she had a very clean house. And we walk in this woman's apartment, and you know when you walk in like your grandmother's house and it has that grandma smell? And, and, and we all know that smell, you know the grandma here. And then I watched him, instead of going, asking where her bathroom was, he goes to her kitchen sink and he spits in it. She had a home attendant who was, um, either she was Haitian or she was African, and that woman became incensed about it. She was like, uh-uh, how dare you spit in the, in the, in the sink? What are you, an animal? His response to her was disrespectful. Like he dismissed her. And I remember I was, again, 23, 23, your, your head is all over the place on this job because you, you, know, you have to conform, but there's so many things that say it's not right. If you are in a toxic system, you have a tendency to embrace the, uh, the toxic mindset of it. When I was in sixth grade, um, I got in trouble constantly for getting into fights, so I was put in this pro program called Explorers. I got to see how cops did they work in there, and ever since then, I guess, being a cop was one of my passions. When I was ex in Explorers, the cops were like, I've always seen the good side of them, but when I see videos on social media of cops, it's, you just see the other side of them, beating on kids, locking them up for nothing. They're two-faced to me. I feel like I wouldn't treat somebody like that, especially somebody that hasn't been in that situation before. If I bring somebody into an interrogation room, I'm going to ask them questions about their past, try to get to know them, connect with them, it could have been they doing it for their family, trying to get something from their family. Not everybody's been a criminal their whole life. I'm not going to be like the cops, the way the cops is now in this generation. I'm going to change and try my hardest, make it one of my biggest goals to make a change in the community. I think change starts with us really taking control of how we want policing to be in our community. That's number one, going inside, or number two, starting your own organizations or entities uh, that will describe what policing should look like. One of these groups, like this activist group in my school called Millie Hoodies, they were just starting and they wanted me, to be, wanted me to be a part of it. And we just started to speak about situations that happen on in our world. Messages for any officer. You are human first. Many people feel like 
you know, since we're minorities, we don't have voices. What we say doesn't matter. Some people in my community are like, it don't matter if we speak up, nothing gonna change. Yeah. That's not true. I always want this field to work, but it's kind of like, I get like down here. So I'm like kind of switching up my field to like art. What's most beautiful about being black is like, just art period, we always did great in art. Every time we have a struggle, we always had like, something beauty about it. Jim Crow era, jazz movement was going on. Now it's like hip hop. Every time we go like police brutality, there was always a song about it. I would want the NYPD to know that I'm a civilized, caring individual and I try to never bring any harm to anybody around me. Definitely not in my community. I wouldn't want anything to happen to anybody in my community. One thing I want the NYPD to know about me is that I am not who they think I am because of these stereotypes. Like, I'm a positive person. I'm trying to do the right thing. We're all the same. I'm like you, and you're like me, and nobody's different. My film was inspired by an anonymous like Instagram that people have, they posted um, like racism, racist experiences um, that students have had. And um, the response from that, from the school board was um, really amazing. I didn't think they would like respond at all, but they've been working with that like Instagram. And um, since then they have made lots of different inclusion acts and they've made like new classes like we have a new class called ethnic studies and ethnic literature where we're going to be learning about um, different cultures which was not a thing before the instagram account our film was very much up to the audience interpretation like obviously there is really not a whole lot of context at all in our film i mean we don't even speak but the audience can get the sense that there is something bad that happened at that party, something negative that we are really trying to get away from. And whatever that is, is kind of up to interpretation. What was the meaning behind the messy room? Was it the aftermath of the party? It was basically like the aftermath of the party, but I think it can also um, be interpreted in, in a different way to be um, how the characters are feeling, that their feelings are all over the place and there's chaos happening in their lives and in the storyline. Was this film shot during COVID? Yes, it was. It was shot for a summer project and we shot it all at my house, except for that one scene in the parking deck.
Uh, how is everybody doing tonight? If you're feeling good, I want you to raise your hands like this. All right, good. Everybody looks shiny and happy. Uh, I'm Chris Hastings. I am an executive producer uh, of television and documentary at WGBH in Boston. Uh, for those of you who don't know what WGBH is, it's one of the largest PBS stations in the country. Uh, and we are a partner tonight on this event, and I'm super glad to be here. Uh, I was watching everybody's films on YouTube tonight, and I'm so excited to see the amazing talent in this group. I get to watch a lot of work, um, but I was telling the group before everybody got here, uh, um, I started making movies when I was 10 years old, and I did not have all the tools that you guys had, and I am super, super impressed and excited about uh, to be here with you, uh, to share your work and to hear your stories of making your films. Um, a few things that I want to tell the audience. Uh, this QA session is supposed to be about 30 minutes long. Um, please do let us know if you have a question that you like to ask one of the filmmakers tonight. Um, I believe there is a feature where you can raise your hand uh, at the bottom. Um, when you do ask your question, please do specify which film or which filmmaker you'd like to talk to. Um, and as we go through the night, please do po be polite, listen, uh, and really engage with these young filmmakers. You know, it's really hard to release your work and to be able to sort of talk about it. And so we are here to support all of you um, and to hear your voice. Uh, but before I go any further, I want our friend Lionel uh, to tell us a little bit about tonight's program. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being part of this live q and and also for watching um, our 24th annual DIYDS Film Festival. Um, and um, I would like to introduce our um, youth curators here. Um, we have three of them. Um, Xavier. Do you mind just unmuting yourself and just saying hello so that everybody can see you really quickly? Hi, I'm Xavier. And um, Nala. Hi. 
And uh, we have one more, but she's not able to be here right now. Um, her name is Amara. And they've all been part of the DIYDS for the past at least two years. And they've been doing a lot of hard work um, when it comes to designing the um, the t-shirts, the um, and other like promotional material, and also just watching a lot of films that we got this year. Um, due to COVID, we didn't get a ton of films like we used to, um, but we uh, we we got some great ones, and you guys witnessed some of the best ones that uh, we got this year. So, um, so tonight will just be an opportunity for you to ask not only the filmmakers but also um, our youth curators about the process of their work and any questions or any comments that you'd like to give them when it comes to how their work made you feel. All right, and um, I'll pass it back to Chris and our moderators for tonight. All right, thank you so much. So here's how this is gonna work. We're gonna bring up to the stage, the virtual stage, uh, three filmmakers at a time. Um, and for all of you who are guests, we really, really want to hear your questions. Um, so please do use the uh, chat function at the bottom and raise your hand. I'm sorry, raise your hand. Uh, and we will call on you to ask questions. Um, and what I'm going to do is bring up the first three, Tavion, Tashan, and Kimberly. Uh, Tashan's film is Starlight Square. Um, Tashan's film is Hip Hop and Literacy. Um, and Gabriel's film is A Better Tomorrow. Um, so, oh, because we're all together still. So um, I'm going to start with um, each of you. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourselves um, and tell us um, what is your current favorite film, uh, just so people get to know a little bit about yourself. Um, and then I'm gonna ask you to tell me a little bit about your film and why you made it. So it's a two part question. So starting with Tavion Pollard, tell me what is your favorite current film in the world? And then tell me a little bit about your film and why you made it, Patty. Um, well, there's a lot of really good films obviously out right now, but um, one I watched really recently that I appreciated was The Way I See It by Pete Souza. Um, he is a White House photographer in the Obama administration, and it was a really good movie. It was really interesting. So um, I loved watching that. So that's what I've been thinking about lately. And um, well, my movie was Starlight Square 2020, and um, I just made it because I uh, thought it was really interesting. I was put in contact with um, uh, the Starlight Square and people who were running it, and so I got to know them a little bit better, and I thought it was a a really cool project that was happening, so I wanted to kind of document it and show it uh, to the world, I guess. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna move to Tayshawn Taylor. It's your current favorite movie out in the world. Um, and then tell us a little bit about your film and why you made it. Sheesh, I don't know how to answer that question. I forgot every single film <laughs> that you watched up until this point. Um, but the only one that's on my mind right now is Finding Nemo, so we're just gonna go with that. Oh, I said any film in the world, so it's all good. <laughs> all right, cool. So the reason why I made my uh, the reason why I made my video, aside from me, uh, you know, having this be a final for Amazon Audible, um, I wanted to make this film because I've always been wondering about like why, about uh, the connection between education and hip hop, considering how like Harvard has awards for hip hop artists and how they like, you know, host and like have classes based around certain uh, albums and or curriculums. Like for example, like there's apparently like a, a class at Harvard that is dissecting the meaning of To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar mm -hmm. and I wanted to dive a little deeper in that and, and ask the question of, uh, can we start implementing the same kind of education in high schools or middle schools or anything like that? And 
uh, if it's possible, and also like what kind of methods will we actually start like you know bringing into the curriculum once we start you know getting the ideas flowing and actually start like you know greenlighting a lot of uh, actionable steps. So that's what I uh, that's why I started my film. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna move over to Kimberly. Kimberly. Um, let me know what is your favorite film out in the world <laughs> and tell us a little bit about why you wanted to make your film. Chris, I'm not sure if Kimberly's on just yet. So let us uh, move on. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Let's move on to, um, and I think Haley is also, um, we're waiting for her to arrive. Okay. So well, maybe let's... we move to Dennis. Or... Before we go any further, are there any questions for Tava, Tavi or Tashan before we move on to the ne our next three? Okay, well, we'll come back if we need to. Uh, next three people on my list, you said Haley's not here or Haley is here? Not here yet. All right, so Dennis and Dion. Yes. Yep. All right, so Dennis, tell us your favorite film and tell us a little bit about your film. Uh, yeah, uh, favorite movie is probably Drive. It's been that for a while. Uh, I like a lot of different movies. I've recently watched Black Swan, which I really love, but you know. Uh, what inspired me to make this? Uh, basically, it was kind of a lot of happenstance how I came up with the idea. Uh, for whatever reason, the idea of blackface was on my mind. Uh, I believe I watched some content creators talking about the art form. And it, I got curious. And so randomly, I decided to Google just how many times people have actually done it. And it kind of floored me how many people did it. Like I said it uh, in the questionnaire after my film screen, but like so many people did it. I thought it might be worth it to sort of do an examination of that, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of how it spawned, so. Cool. Um, I'm going to move over to Dion. Um, would you tell us your favorite film and why made you to decide to make your film um my favorite film is jaws because i like like how the action scenes like uh and the music like make it very tense and um my why i made the film was because the client he, he like he talked to us and then it got me like this idea and um how, how to make the film so I try to make it moving um, educate people about schools and yeah okay um, I want to get around to everybody um, and I'm probably gonna come back and ask more questions to everyone once we go one round one full circle uh, next three folks on the list uh, Michelle um, Nyla and Ariana. Uh, starting with Michelle, Growing Up Mix, tell us your favorite film and why and what you why you made your film, Growing Up Mix. Hello, um, <laughs> my name is Michaela. I just Michaela, I to... sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so my favorite film recently is uh, a Netflix film called Enola Holmes. Um, and it's like kind of based in the 18th century, but it's just like really fun and adventurous and has a lot of themes of women's empowerment, which I really love. Um, and I think I made my film because I wanted to just explore um, just like the theme of identity. And um, I really wanted to merge two different genres of um, like a narrative piece and a documentary piece and kind of see um, how that those would work together. Cause mm -hmm. I was also inspired by like TV shows, how usually they'll have two different storylines that flip back and forth. So I want to experiment with that. Um, 
And I also kind of, there's not many shows or like movies that have the mixed race experience, except for like mixed dish now. Um, so I wanted to like add that to the world. <laughs> Very cool. Um, it looks like we have a couple teams here. So Nyla and Shay Shayna, is that the pronouncer right? right? Uh, cops art colorblind. I think they're still, I think Nyla's not able to make it. We might be waiting on um, no Shania. So um, let's okay. talk to Elysium and Ariana and Eleanor or Ellie. Hey guys, how you doing? Good. All right, so Good. between the two of you, each of you, each of you tell me what your favorite film is and then together tell me what, why you decided to make your film. Um, my favorite film changes like every day, but recently I saw Soul and I really liked it. Right now, I'd have to say my favorite film is Joker, but it does change and like rotate very, very often. Cool. And why did you guys decide to make your film? Um, I knew that I wanted to make something super cinematic and dramatic, and I know Ella shared the same sentiment. Um, and we basically wanted to create something where the, we would invoke the audience to create their own narrative of the film, where they would create their own story and their own idea of what it meant by pairing the image with the audio. Yeah, we did it for a short summer camp, but we had pretty much the freedom to create whatever we wanted. And we really wanted to make something that both we enjoyed making and we also enjoyed watching, which is why we went the sort of more cinematic direction that we did. Cool. Uh, I noticed you came in as a team and you know, filmmaking generally is a, is a team sport. Um, and this is really for all the filmmakers. What was the hardest part about making your film? And feel free to um, raise your hand. I'm gonna call on somebody to make it a little easier. Dennis, what was the hardest thing about making your film? Hardest thing for me was easily the editing process. Uh, a lot of, most, as far as documentaries go, this, I've made a couple. Uh, this one brought new eases and new challenges. I didn't have to bring a camera. I just had to record a voiceover and I had to write a little script for me, for myself. But it meant I had to go to a lot of resources to get footage, a lot of extra headaches during the editing process. So I think that was probably the biggest difficulty for me. Audience, if you have questions for any of these guys, please let me know, okay? Uh, Tayshawn, it looks like you had your hand up about my question of what was the hardest thing about making your film? The hardest, there were several things that were uh, difficult about making the film because there were a lot of ideas circulating uh, in the, in like the planning process. But I would say the absolute hardest thing was color correcting and animations. That was really hard because uh, there would be times where like the animations were like overlapping, like over the letters and everything. And I kid you not, it took me at least like 30 minutes to fix it because like it just, it just kept moving all over the place like willy nilly. And like actually trying to find out where to put those animations and then when to cut them out because I wanted to maintain a very consistent pace because this was a very musically driven piece. So I wanted to make sure that I had the same kind of rhythm in both the editing as well as the pacing and the and the uh, interviews as well. And also just the music. I wanted to make sure that like everything flowed together and that it actually felt like a piece where it's like, yeah, like there's a certain rhythm to the way that it's edited. And capturing that was a really, really hard thing to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Color correction is really hard. And I was, you know, to see that, how well it was put together, I was really impressed. Um, how many, I think I was, Michaela, you casted people from your family, right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> so how was that? 
working with your family? It was really fun, um, but it was it was my first time like directing um, people. Actually, I hadn't worked with like actors besides myself before, um, so it was kind of interesting because obviously my parents are older than me, so it was kind of <laughs> fun to like tell them what to do. Um, I think. I actually had a harder time directing myself because I'm not an actress like at all. So um, I don't know. I think it's it's easy to be very hard on yourself and like um, I don't know, just like you hold yourself to a very high standard. So I think that was probably the hardest part for me. Cool. Um, I have a couple questions that have come in. A question for Tavi: uh, When did the filming take place? Wondering if the pandemic slowed down traffic. To get this great venue before it got off the ground. Um, well, the filming for this took place in July and August of 2020, so um, it was right as it was right before and right as Starlight opened up because there's a you see there's a lot of footage in there from like the first event that they ever had in Starlight. Um, so it was d born during the pandemic, which. Um, was not their initial intention, but I'm sure it definitely slowed down traffic compared to what it normally would be, but it also created this whole other dynamic of um, kind of what Starlight meant to a lot of people. So I think it, it kind of, it, it elevated their 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 goals a little bit, I think, just because it was able to give a place um, for people to perform and go and watch and feel a little more normal because it was outside and so big that you could stay safely apart from each other. So I I think it probably hurt the traffic, the pandemic, but then also maybe gained a little bit just because of the uniqueness of it. Cool. Uh, I got a question that came in and it's, it's written and it's not directed to anybody, but it's a good question for everybody. Uh, do you plan on continuing to make movies? And if you do, shake your head. And if I see any no's, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, I was kind of like that, too. What would right. you say, Tejo? Am I going? All right. All right. Um, I do plan on continuing to make uh, films. I would love to keep making films with Audible because uh, even though, like, I was pretty much educating a lot of the folks at Audible about, like, the history of hip-hop, it was really funny because the first meeting we had, I feel like I was trying to give a, a, hist a history lesson with hip-hop and just, like, hip-hop started uh, in this year, in this area, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, and I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I feel like a lot of people don't not actually know what hip-hop is. Like, the people that I did this project with didn't know what it was. But, like, regardless, it was a lot of fun. And I still have a lot of ideas. And I hope that uh, Audible can't, that me and Audible can ex end up doing some extra work in the future. But uh, aside from that, I plan on continuing to make films, whether they be educational or, like, scripted or just... Uh, a visual appeal type of thing. I feel like that would, uh, I feel like making films is a lot of fun and I actually grew like a huge love for camera work. So that's definitely gonna be something I'm gonna do in the future. Cool. Couple more questions came in from Michaela. Uh, folks would like to hear a little bit more about what it was like mixing genres. Um, I think like, documentary kind of comes easier to me just because um i can come up with a ton of questions and like have a conversation and it was also with my friends so that made it easier but i really wanted to make a narrative piece and i hadn't um written like a real script for like a bigger production like this before so i think that's kind of like the main reason i went about it um but then also like i wanted to show um like through a documentary, like you can do the conversation part, but I want to show like an actual situation of um, what we were talking about happening so that people like can see it happen in real life. But... Excellent, excellent. Chris, um, we had a, another question for Michaela while we're on that and it was came in from DJ, who's an attendee and asked Michaela, did you, feel, did you and your friend find more clarity around your identity after making the film? And was there more confusion or questions? Can you repeat the last part, please? Sure. Did you and your friend find more clarity around your identity after making the film? And was there more confusion or questions? Mm -hmm. I think we, at least um, for me, I felt more, um, 
like not not questions like I felt more like less confused about it um and I think my friend too as well um but I'm not sure I can't speak for her but yeah I think when I was making it I was asking a lot of questions and talking with my parents a lot just on those issues um and I think the whole process really helped me um just yeah be less confused about it Cool. We've got one more question for Tayshawn. Uh, says, say more about your idea to bring hip hop education to middle school and high school and whether you see a role for yourself in this effort. So I guess the idea that I had was more along the lines of just uh, using it as an example for certain uh, literary terms. Like for example, when I was in high school, like we would learn about like poetry and or literary terms and then we would read like Shakespeare or something. But like, I would also feel like it would be pretty cool, which is why I started the video the way that I did with Billy Dean Thomas, uh, using like, you know, very specific literary terms as to like pertaining to like the freestyle that they did. And as a po- and, uh, Oh, what am I trying to say? And uh, referring to me being a part of this effort, um, I do. Uh, I actually haven't necessarily uh, taught any classes that were uh, related in, you know, uh, hip hop and or performance and things like that. I had a great, I had a few great ideas, and I also felt like uh, it would be like a really uh, brilliant opportunity for. Uh, for people to get really engaged with like, you know, uh, hip hop and like, just like poetry terms and things like that. I feel like it would be really awesome for me to be a part of that. But I also feel like this would be a, I also feel like this would be like a, a, a huge opportunity for like other neighboring artists. Like for example, Oompa, Billy Dean Thomas, or uh, just kind of throwing it out there, like Sean Wire, like a lot of local uh, folks around the area, uh, as well as Lizzo Four. Like he, he definitely, he's a, he's actually a gym teacher. So like, he definitely knows what it's like to like, you know, educate folks and like, you know, do things like that. I feel like, uh, I would love to be a part of it as well, but I also understand that it's also like a community effort and that uh, it can't just be exclusively just for me, that it also has to involve like other members of other artists of the community and of the area as well. And I feel like a lot of communication has to come between the teacher and the artist in order for things like that to like move smoothly. So it's not just gonna be a thing where it's like, hey, you wanna come to my class and then you know, do this thing. It's like, you have to make sure that like, there's an, there's a goal and that like, it's going to be effective. You know what I mean? You have to make sure that it's gonna definitely like, you know, actually make uh, an impression on, you know, uh, young people in school and stuff like that. So I feel like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ideas there. So yeah, Very oh, that cool. is a question. <laughs> I think you did. I think you did. Um, keep the questions coming. We got one for Dion. Dion, did Homies Empowerment use your film to promote its local program? Um, so I intern at this nonprofit nonprofit organization, uh, Big Cat, and uh, clients basically they pay to have their film made by um, kids or teenagers, mm-hmm. and. Uh, homies and parent reached out and we made a film for them promoting their uh uh yeah their school okay we have a um, question for ellie and ariana um yep. did you enjoy working as a team was it easy or difficult to make creative decisions um I mean, we were already friends, so it was pretty easy for us to work together. And also we, once we got the general idea down of what we wanted our film to be, it was very easy to just go on Zoom and work together and just storyboard everything. I was just gonna say we work together in like music and film and we're very similar people. So we don't really care, like no matter how crazy our our ideas are we can we always know we can bounce them off each other and we'll just come up with something as a follow-up to that was there 
one thing that you were that one of you were better at than the other? I think we shared a lot, but I think I was really good at like creating environments or worlds that are realistic or like kind of have a vibe um, to the story that people can understand. And I was more like focusing on like the camera work and stuff and trying to make sure it looked nice. Cool. Um, we have two questions for the curators. Um, and I think the curators are all still on, right, Lionel? Uh, the first question is, what drew you all to these films? What were the qualities you were looking for when you were organizing the festival? They just liked them. It was just... That's what yeah, yeah, was. we just like <laughs> <laughs> no, we um we were looking for um basically like overall quality of films. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were like not too long, and if they were long, there the pacing was well enough to be engaged in it. So you actually like taking in the message they're trying to portray in their film. So um, that was basically the criteria, and um. Sometimes members would like have like a more personal connection towards it, um, depending on what kind of subject matter it's tackling, um, which I guess kind of went into it, but the, generally it was more of a, like a quality type thing. And if it's just fun to watch. Fun to watch. I like that. Um, all right. So I don't have any more questions. Oh, wait, never mind. We've got one more from DJ again to everyone. Has making the film on the subject made it easier for you to have that conversation in groups? And do you think we're on the edge of seeing a shift from this practice? It's a he, whoever asked that question, they got deep. So Dennis, I'm going to kick it to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as have I have I been able to discuss it with many of my friends? Not entirely, because a lot of my friends aren't really film people. Uh, however, it has made it a lot easier. I know a lot more about the subject. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that ended up getting cut from the film that is that I still went into more detail on. Like I did research into the original Ocean's Eleven. I looked up Watermelon Man, all that stuff. As far as whether or not I see a shift in the practice, I think where it sort of lies in the public eye right now and that almost universally it's seen as a bad thing, I don't really imagine that it would change anymore mm -hmm. apart from seeing that it's a universal bad. Uh, I can't say whether or not that's the case, but I don't really see it, that sort of perspective of it being universally bad changing much anytime soon. Yeah, that's, that's deep subject matter. Um, for everybody, because I know you all probably shot this during COVID times, um, a question came in about that. Um, how, uh, how did you guys, how much of your collaborations took up place over Zoom? Like, did you do it all virtually or how was it, how did it all work for you all? For me, it was quite a bit of in-person and Zoom. Uh, it was heavily mixed. A lot of the pre-production happened over Zoom since I was working with CCTV um, over the summer. So a lot of that was, their whole program was taking place on Zoom. So I had talked to a lot of people there and kind of, scripted and did ideas and um, even edited a little bit over Zoom just to like um, make sure the stories were going well together. But um, all the all the filming took place in person. I didn't do any virtual interviews, which is the original plan. But after we were able to kind of go there and see what um, it was like, it seemed like we could do some in-person interviews, um, which turned out really well. And I'm glad we did because we were able to keep it safe, but also I think it elevated the quality a thousand a thousand percent like um the just the whole aspect of it i think flowed really well after we were able to do a lot of filming in person and so i guess the majority of the time was also spent in person because when we were filming we filmed over the course of a few weeks and stuff so we would end up just going back there all the time so 
I mean, if you're just going time-wise, it definitely was spent more in person, but um, like editing and planning all happened on Zoom. So it was kind of like, I guess a little bit split. Okay. And Dennis, you look like you wanted to sign, on, sign in on that. Uh, as far as how my perspective go, I can't speak for everyone because mine was uh, had di a lot of different circumstances. Most of my stuff was not in person, mostly because a lot of this was done by myself. Uh, like I wrote the script, I voiced it, I did the editing, everything apart from the music and the footage that you see was all pretty much done by me. So as, as far as what my experience was, I didn't really have much in-person input. And even then all of the Zoom input I got from like people I was getting help from was very minimal, so. Very cool. All right, so I don't have any other questions. Were there any more questions from the audience? I think there was a great wrap up question on, do you all feel like you're gonna pursue a career in film? And maybe that could be our, a great last question. Tayshawn says yes, Dennis, uh -huh. go ahead. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up. I think you guys are all amazing and I really do hope you keep making movies and telling your own stories. Um, I, no matter what, it, when you make your story, it's your story. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Um, I like the theme of this, this whole festival. Do it your damn self uh, and really do take control of that camera and the edit system and those lights and tell your own story. You control the narrative. Thank you so much. Lionel, you want to jump in here? Um, yeah, so to everybody here, our guests, our filmmakers and our DIYDS teams, um, just a big thank you um, um, because um, this turned out to be amazing despite um, it not being like how it used to be um, with this being all virtual and a big thank you to all the CAC staff who helped out and supported um, this festival and to help make it happen and um, I just can't thank you enough like you guys have no idea <laughs> how much I would just want to say thank you thank you thank you thank you and for the filmmakers even though um, this past year was hard on everybody in, on different levels, you were still able to create something. And you were still able to persevere that way and also let your voice be heard. And that's something that you definitely need to be congratulated about, um, congratulated for, I should say. Um, so once again, thank you. And thank you to uh, Solomon McCown and Sensi for helping with this um, Zoom event. Um, and thank you to um, board members that are here, CAC board members, because like without them, like we wouldn't be able to, like none of this would be possible. So I hope you guys have a great weekend and hopefully we'll see your work again in the future. So please send us more, send us your work and keep in touch. All right. Thank you and have a great night, everybody. Goodbye.